Well, good morning and welcome again, uh, our Christ Baptist Church family and those who are joining in for our study in the book of Daniel. And so far we've covered the first six chapters of Daniel up to this point, and now we're in Daniel chapter 7. And as well as going through our study of the book of Daniel, we're also doing a video series on each day in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, the week, uh, we call it His Passion Week, before he was crucified. And we're going to see some parallels between what's going on in the book of Daniel and what happened in that Passion Week as well. But for now, what we have here is our uh, study of Daniel. We're in Daniel chapter 7. So if your Bibles are open to Daniel chapter 7, we now get into some of the deeper water of this book. The first six chapters, uh, we just ended yesterday with Daniel and the lion's den, something that's quite familiar and had some stories before about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and again, familiar, stories we're familiar with, that just kind of flowed along about how Daniel ministered in the Babylonian Empire. But now we're in the first of, actually, three visions that Daniel was given. And so now we're into the realm of prophecy, an apocalyptic prophecy, where it's going to be very difficult uh, to, to try to get the, the meaning uh, behind everything that's here. So we'll try to, to explain this for you and uh, see if we can't let the Bible help interpret for us what's going on. So if your Bible are open to Daniel chapter 7, uh, Daniel chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 1, what we see here right away is, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of, Bam, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind, as he lay on his bed, and then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Wow. So far, Daniel twice had to interpret dreams for the king. The king had to tell him his dream, and he interpreted it. Now Daniel gets a dream. He himself gets a dream. And we get a date here when it says the first year of Belshazzar. Now who is Belshazzar? We learned yesterday. Belshazzar is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And we know that Belshazzar, historically, he got his reign in 551 or 552 BC, which means Daniel has been in Babylon 55 years. So this puts him somewhere easily between 65, 70 years old, maybe a little bit more. That's how old Daniel is in this, in this section of Daniel chapter 7, the first year of Belshazzar. So it's about as well, maybe somewhere around 13, 14 years before Daniel went into the lion's den. But it's in the first year of Belshazzar, and he had a dream that disturbed him. And he didn't understand it. He didn't get the meaning of it. We learn in the chapter that he had to get assistance for that. But you know what Daniel did? Unlike King Nebuchadnezzar, who said, I don't remember the dream, it was so distressing. In chapter two, or in verse two, he says, I was, or at the end of verse 1, he says, I wrote the dream down and I summarized it. So he actually did that. He woke up and he, he wrote it down. The dream really distressed him significantly. And, and there are some dreams that do that. Some dreams really, really can distress you and you, and you, you wonder if there's a spiritual component to it. You wonder if God's speaking to you. We've had that before. I've been, many of us have had this experience. Don't know what to do about it. So Daniel had this right here. And he tells us in verse 2, I was looking in my vision by night, and he said, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now before we go running off and try to figure out what winds of heaven are in the great sea, uh, he does say the great sea, which would be the Mediterranean, really. That's the sea that they were used to. That was always called the great sea. And the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Four winds of heaven, I think we just let that be what it is. Winds of all four points of the compass are coming and stirring up the great sea uh, there. And one of the things that we'll see is the idea of, of the sea, uh, we see as well, uh, if we see it in Revelation, we also see it actually in verse 17 uh, that tells us that the sea is going to be the nations, the people, the earth, all that's on it. 
but here it said it's stirring up the width of the Great Sea, and I, I think what we can see is in that area, the Mediterranean area, there's going to be a lot of activity. So the great winds are stirring up the activity of this area. And so that starts it off. And then verse 3 he says, Four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. Notice that, different from one another. Each one different, and the four great beasts. Now remember the dream that Daniel interpreted for the king was a statue of a man. So that was, that was a man. The second dream was a tree. And then here we have beasts here. Let's take a look at these beasts from verses 4 to 7. First was like a lion that had the wings of an eagle. It kept looking until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was also given to it. Behold, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear. It was raised up on one side, three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth, and thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Let's stop there for a second. What are these beasts and what do they represent? What's going on with this? Well, Daniel, all the way to verse 15, he's just recording the dream. He's just recording the dream. But to help us move along in, in the short time that we have, I'm going to give the interpretation because all the interpretation is here in verse 17 tells us these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. That's all we have. The person who is helping Daniel interpret the dream, one of those standing by in the dream, so Daniel was getting the interpretation in his dream, ideally like an angel or something like that was he asked him and he said the four beasts these great beasts which are four in number are four kings who will rise from the earth so verses four to seven we're looking at kingdoms now we just need to combine this with chapter two and see how we can see some similarities first we take a look at verse four first beast was like a lion, but had the wings of an eagle. Well, that's kind of strange. What would be like that? Well, Jeremiah tells us. Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 19 to 22, tells us, and he describes the Babylonian kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. He describes it as Verse 19 of chapter 49 of, of Jeremiah. Behold, one will come up like a lion from the thickets of the Jordan. And then he goes all the way down to verse 22 describing, Behold, he will mount up and swoop like an eagle and spread out his, eagle, and spread out his wings. So he's describing Babylon coming against his enemies here as a lion and an eagle. So that would tell us in Daniel chapter 7 that like a lion and wings like an eagle sounds a lot like it would be Babylon. And, and, and then there's more in the verse that would give confirmation to that. He said, I kept looking until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. Why all that language? Well, remember Daniel chapter 4? Nebuchadnezzar was proud. He was brought low, acted like an animal. And then his mind was restored to him and he came back and his kingdom was given back to him. I kept looking at this beast until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. So its wings were plucked and fell to the ground and then eventually when he acknowledged that God is sovereign, he lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man and a human mind was given to it. 
This is right out of Daniel chapter 4. So this tells us the first beast is the kingdom of Babylon, just like it was in Daniel chapter 2. And I think if we just are consistent and follow along with what Daniel chapter 2 says, it'll follow. Verse 5, Behold, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. Well, a bear. Now, what do we know about a bear? Well, a bear is very terrifying and hungry and, and, and that. But the main thing you want to notice here is that it was raised up on one side. It means one side is higher than the other of this bear. Well, remember in Daniel chapter 2, the second kingdom was that of the Medes and the Persians, two of them, and the Persians were a bit stronger. Cyrus conquered the Medes totally about the same time in, uh, in 550, and then it consolidated them, and it became the Medes and the Persians after that, and they came in and took over Babylon. And he said on his mouth there were three ribs between its teeth. Well, historically, the Medes and the Persians had three significant countries that they conquered in three major battles. The country of Lydia, Babylonia, and Egypt are three right there. There are three ribs in its mouth. So that just says, historically that happened. It seems to fit. That's a, that's a good idea of saying what this is, especially when we want to match chapter 2 with chapter 7. Thirdly, after this I kept looking, behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So a leopard, which is, we know from Africa, that is the deadliest killer. And it had four wings of a bird, not two wings, but four, which means it is faster than any other animal. And had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Well, if we follow along again, chapter 2, this sounds like it would be the Greeks and it would be Alexander the Great. Makes total sense. Alexander the Great's battle characteristics were actually, the, the, he was the first one to employ what is called Blitzkrieg, which is you just rush to the next battle and you surprise your enemy and you overwhelm them. And that's what he did. He came fast, didn't take time to regroup. And he used speed as his weapon and conquered the whole known world at that time then. And so we can see that those are the kingdoms. And then after this, I kept looking in the night visions, verse 7, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. Notice the iron? Well, what did we see in Daniel chapter 2? Iron mixed with clay. Large iron teeth, it devoured and crushed and trampled down to the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. One of the things that makes this different, remember how in Daniel chapter 2, that, that fourth part of the statue and the feet and toes were partly of iron, partly of clay. That's different than gold, silver, bronze. Now you've got a mixture of iron and clay. That's different, very different. And it was very brittle, but it was very hard. And they tried to come together, but they couldn't. Well, this is different than the rest. Crushed and trampled down. And it had ten horns, which I would just say the ten horns are ten kings. We, we see horns throughout. Uh, the book of Revelation, we see it in Daniel. Seven heads and ten horns are kings. We see it again in verse 20 are basically kings that come. And so there's more kings, there's more diversity, but it's very brutal just like what we saw in Daniel chapter 2. So this is what we see, using the Bible to interpret Scripture. We see a lot of, of there, just especially comparing Revelation 17 and 18 in particular, describes seven heads, ten horns. We've got the beast in Revelation 13, seven heads, ten horns. And the, and the horns are kings and kingdoms. So, that's all happening. I gave you the interpretation because 
Scripture gives it to us here, but very briefly in verse 17, there are four kings. Well, we just painted those kings. It matches Daniel 2. This is the best interpretation you can get. And it's going to match exactly what happens in Daniel chapter 8 as well. Now, while he's on the on the bed, he's, he's contemplating these kings, these horns. Behold, another horn, a little one, came up upon them. Three of the first horns were pulled out by the roof before it, and behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. So, out of these horns, there was a little horn that came up. And it came up among them, and it pulled out three of the other horns out by the roots. But this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that are in great boast. So it really gives it a human flavor here. It's not an event. It's a person. A very boastful person. And, and boastful would not be in terms of power. Look at the kings ahead. Each one of them conquered the world. You, you've got Alexander the Great. You've got Artaxerxes. Uh, you, you've got Cyrus, you've got Nebuchadnezzar. These are great kings. They were boastful. They thought they conquered the world. Well, if this one says he's conquered the world, he's no different than the rest. So, if boastful in what way? It's going to be boastful against God. That's when you're really boastful. And that's what he's doing. And so, we can see that this fourth horn ripped up three horns, took their space, and then starts being very, very boastful, specifically against God. We're going to see that in a few verses. He kept going, kept looking. Verse 9, I kept looking at this dream until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. Throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were burning fire. Not only that, a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. Myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. What is this? Well, as he saw all these kingdoms, especially this boastful one with his horn coming, but now he's seeing something different. Thrones are being set up, but the one throne that was actually having someone seated was somebody called the Ancient of Days. Ancient of Days. This means it's someone outside of time before days began. Everything about him was like white snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. So there's a picture here that Daniel seen in the vision. He didn't see the actual person in ancient of days, but he saw in the dream something that would personify him. And his throne was ablaze with flame. So what we see here are elements of time, we would see elements of holiness. I mean, everything is pure white, all down and, and, and clean, like pure snow and flame. The best way is there is it could be holiness, righteousness, like in Isaiah chapter six, where the the angels were claiming holy, 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 and they're burning. Righteousness is always burning. That's what we see in Malachi chapter three. You will be like a refiner's fire. And so, thrown as a blaze of flames. Flames are coming out of his throne. It's not burning it up. And then you have thousands upon thousands, and then ten thousands upon ten thousands. Everybody there is attending to the Ancient of Days. And the books were opened. This is why this is the big picture here. Daniel 7 could be called the big picture chapter. It's the hinge of all of Daniel. Right here it starts. It says, when you're worried about what's going on, when you're worried about the situation you're in, like what we have here, it's a political situation around the world, when some big catastrophe is happening or some big political upheaval is happening, it's time to look at the big picture. That makes this picture very small that we're living in today. Lockdown is very small when you look at the big picture. It might affect your day-to-day, minute-to-minute operations, but 
There's something about the big picture, which is there's going to be king upon king upon king upon king, which is why we shouldn't get worried about elections. We should do our part, but we should not ever get anxious about them because God is putting in charge. He's granting sovereignty to whom he will. And we do our part. And as it plays out, we're saying, great, we're with the Ancient of Days in the big picture. We're with him. Because what happens in the big picture? The books are opened. The books are opened. In verse 11, Then I kept looking because of the sound of his boastful words, which the horn was speaking. And I kept looking until the beast was slain. See, he kept looking in two ways. He kept looking for the reason, because of the sound of the words. It was just so offensive. So he kept looking. Hoping for something to happen. So he kept looking until the beast was slain. And his body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. This is described in the book of Revelation, where the beast, the false prophet, and even Satan himself is, is eventually thrown into the lake of fire. So this human ruler is judged by the Ancient of Days into eternal judgment. What's interesting here is verse 12, as for the rest of the beast, meaning those kingdoms and those areas in the Mediterranean, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. Which says, after this final beast, this final king, this final blasphemer gets judged, the others aren't judged yet. And they're given some more time. Which says, there's going to be some more time after he is judged. And I think this speaks a lot more toward a millennial kingdom. After the, the beast is judged, there's a kingdom set up. And all the other kingdoms are part of it, but they have to give their worship to the one true king, our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up in ancient days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. Now, why was why did the Ancient of Days give this kingdom to this Son of Man? Why did he do it? Well, it tells us in verse 14 that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. Because his dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. He will have a kingdom. This one like a Son of Man. It doesn't say he is a Son of Man. It doesn't say he's human. It says he's like one. And I'll tell you, this is exactly, it's why we're doing Daniel and what happened to Jesus during that Passion Week. It didn't happen on Monday, but when he was standing trial on that late Thursday night, Friday morning early, he was asked a question, and the Gospel of Mark records it. And uh, they were asking him, some people had told him in Mark chapter 14, we heard him say, I'll destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I'll build another made without hands. So they said, don't you answer? What do you, what do you say these men are testifying against you? Jesus said this. He said, he, he kept silent and did not answer. And again, the high priest was questioning him and said this, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. He quoted Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, right here, when he was being accused in his trial. He's quoting right here the, out of the dream that Daniel had. He says, I am that one. I'm coming with the clouds of heaven, the Son of Man. And I am the Christ. Who is that? And I'll have a kingdom that will not be destroyed It'll be everlasting. This is the big picture. This is the big picture. It's 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 was there when Jesus came in and taught, and it's here now. Now Daniel was distressed. In verse 16, he says, I was approached, I approached one of those who were standing by, and I began to ask him the meaning. I wanted to know the interpretation. Verse 17. These beasts, which are four in number, the four kings, 
But notice what he says in verse 18. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. This says it's the kingdom is belonging to this Son of Man. But the saints of the highest one, the saints, the holy ones, the, the, those who are with him, they will also receive the kingdom and possess it forever. They're going to be the subjects of the kingdom. They'll have this kingdom. They get a reward. They win. Out of all the kings that come, they win and they get a kingdom. Here's what I want you to see. This is the big picture. Ultimately, Daniel, we win. Ultimately, the saints of the highest one, they win. They get the kingdom. And you know what Daniel's interest is? It should have been, wow, can you tell me more about this kingdom? Tell me more about what it's like. Tell me more about who gets it. Tell me more all about that. That's not what Daniel does. In verse 19, he says, Then I desire to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast. Go back and tell me about the wickedest, most terrifying beast there is. That's what attracts my attention. That's what gives my attraction. Isn't that like all of us? We get all kinds of messages about we win. Here's what heaven looks like. Here's what it is to be with Christ. But we like to run to the book of Revelation and see all those terrifying pictures of scorpions and fire and things coming down to the earth. And, oh my, all this apocalyptic. It, it, it's, it's what draws our attention. The destruction. The fear. We worry about things. But the answer is, we receive the kingdom. But Daniel wanted to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, different than the others, exceedingly dreadful, teeth of iron, claws of bronze, devoured, crushed, trampled down, just like Daniel chapter 2, and the meaning of the ten horns that were on his head, and the other horn which came up, of which three of them fell, he took, took, their, took their kingdoms. He wanted to know about all that. And so he kept looking, and seized that, that horn, that human king, is waging war with the saints and overpowering them. You see, there is a time where it's going to be really, really tough. That's part of God's plan. We don't pray this away. When times of, of governments in the world are coming after us, we pray that we be strong, not that it go away, because this is God's plan. We win. It's for His judgment. Because He will only overpower them until the Ancient of Days comes and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. You see, when you stand up to this oppression against Christ and you stand up like Daniel, judgment will be passed in favor of you. And the time will arrive when the saints take possession of the kingdom. You see, that's the big story. That's where our emphasis should be. It should not be on the prophecies about which kings are going to do what to who and who's going to be worse than the other guy and how bad it is and what's the mark of the beast. None of that should matter. What matters is we get the kingdom with the king and we need to keep looking to the king and being ready for when he comes because we win regardless of what's going on here now. So this interpreter for Daniel says the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth different from the other kingdoms it will devour the whole earth, tread it down and crush it. Out of the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise. You see, there's our interpretation. The horns are kings because verse 24 tells us. And another will arise after them and he'll be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. So out of ten kings, an eleventh is going to pop up and he's going to rip up three of them and take their territory. But the big thing is, is what is why is he boastful? How do we know he's boastful? Verse 25. He will speak out against the Most High, wear down the saints of the Highest One, will intend to make alterations in times and law, and they'll be given into his hand for time, times, and half a time. You say he'll speak out against God, the Most High. He'll wear down the saints. He'll continually do that. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. He's going to try to change the Jewish law. He's going to try to change what morality is. 
see, here's, here's an observation right here. In Daniel chapter 2, we had a picture of a man and a statue. And it was about basically the power of kingdoms. It was basically about strength and might. Daniel chapter 7 has animals of the same kingdoms. And it's really the focus is of their spiritual condition and their morality. That's what's going on. This fourth kingdom takes over. Look, look at his morality and his, his spiritual condition. Wear down the saints of the Most High and tend to change God's law. And those who are following the Holy One, those who are following God, those who are, are looking for the Son of Man, they'll be given into His hand for time, times, and half a time. How long is time, times, and half a time? Well, I'll tell you. It's one time. Times is two. And half a time is a half. So one plus two is three. Plus a half is three and a half. And I'm just going to give you, here we have verses. You can find it in Revelation 11, verse 3, Revelation 12, verse 6, Revelation 12, verse 14, and Revelation 13, verse 5. Go check those out. It'll say time, times, and half a time. It'll say 1,260 days. It'll say 42 months. All of them add up to three and a half years. That's how long it's going to be. There's a lot to say about that, but that's more in the book of Revelation and the time of the Great Tribulation. But this is what this is pointing to right here. The main idea, the court will sit for judgment, his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. So, the saints of the highest one, they get the kingdom, it'll be everlasting, and all the dominions, all the kingdoms, in verse 27, will serve and obey him. This is it. We win. That's the big picture. That's why Jesus, he knew the big picture, which is why he was so calm and he was under conviction. He was under great passion to move this forward because as he goes through what he went through, we move along to get to this point in history. He's passionate about getting to that point. About getting to this point where even though Daniel was just trembling, and this is such a terrifying dream, understood the saints who stay with the Holy One, who stay with Christ, they'll receive the kingdom, regardless of what happens. There's going to be some pressure. There's going to be difficult times. There's going to be oppression against the belief of Israel, the belief of Christianity. Now, just to tell you, maybe I can add into this tomorrow. This event happened in about 167 BC, about 167 years before Christ. This kind of thing was pictured. But it's also spoken up again in the book of 2 Thessalonians that tells us it will happen. So it happened on a small scale, it's going to happen on a major global spiritual scale yet to come. And we're waiting for that to happen. But we win, which is why we need to focus on that aspect and not so much on the nature of the beasts and those kinds of things. But we have them explained here, so we understand this very important book of Daniel here, the, the chapter seven of Daniel, which is really the big picture. So I hope this helps, a lot of complicated stuff, and I hope you're able to follow and take the time to, to look up some of these scriptures to help give some verification. I hope I did some explanation for you. But that's Daniel chapter 7. And boy, we have our work cut out for us again tomorrow. Daniel chapter 8, he had another dream that got into further clarification of what's happening. We'll deal with that tomorrow. Thank you.